Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Note that all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Liz Fernandez. Good morning, everyone, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and our speaker for our webinar today is Dr. Danelle Bickett-Weddle. Dr. Bickett-Weddle is the Associate Director of the Center for Food Security and Public Health, where she has the privilege of working with and educating livestock producers, veterinarians, veterinary students, and the public about animal diseases and how to protect, protect themselves for their livelihood. She manages and writes guidance documents for the secure food supply plans for continuity of business for the beef, milk, sheep, and wool industries. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bickett-Weddle. Thanks, Liz, for hosting, and thanks to the six states and their industry partners that are preparing to address implementing the secure beef supply plan. Our partners in Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas have a big task ahead of them, and I commend them for taking the next step. So as an over introduction, the foot and mouth disease is considered a national animal health emergency should it occur in the United States. There will be animal and animal product movement restrictions, which will certainly have an impact on the continuity of business for the beef industry and all other species impacted by this disease. That's what makes pre-event planning so critical to the livestock industry's survival and ultimately foot and mouth disease control and eradication. And that's what brings us to the Secure Beef Supply Plan. For those less familiar with foot and mouth disease, it is considered the most contagious disease of animals. It's a, a major disease that prevents world trade of animals and their products. And you can see a variety of pictures here, um, not very pleasant photos, but animals that have been impacted by this disease. Now, a lot of the images here in, uh, show death from disease, but it's really not from the disease. It's the control mechanisms that we put in place to try and get ahead of this contagious disease. Uh, animals do get quite sick. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But again, it's not a death-causing disease itself, but we use that as one of our control mechanisms. It affects cattle, sheep, pigs, goats, anything with a cloven hoof. Most importantly, it is not a public health or a food safety concern. So foot and mouth disease virus can be shed by normal appearing cattle two to four days before clinical signs appear. And they shed it in just about every excretion, saliva, urine, milk, and even semen. When we think about how to control this disease, we have to think about how it's spread. Vehicles, so conveyances going from one operation to another without any biosecurity protocol. People's clothing and footwear. Again, not a public health or food safety concern, but we as humans can carry it on our belongings and the equipment that we use with animals. And also that equipment. So whether we're sharing conveyances or anything else to feed animals between operations, it is a risk. So we'll talk a little bit about that in biosecurity and how important it is as one of the control mechanisms. So today I want to talk about the National Movement Standstill, one of the strategies that may be put in place to try and control foot and mouth disease outbreak. Most importantly for the beef industry and all industries impacted is contingency planning for something like that. Once our regulatory officials are comfortable with where the disease is and where the disease isn't, then we need to talk about restarting movement. And that's where the secure beef supply permit guidance comes into play. And lastly, the impetus for this webinar today is state implementation. I like to think that our team that developed the Secure Beef Supply Plan maybe had it easier than what the states are facing now, because now we have to put this into action, working with our industries that are going to be impacted by this, and how does it work in the best way possible when business will not be normal. So first, I want to talk about the National Movement Standstill. This was an exercise policy that was created during ARMAR, which was a foot and mouth disease functional exercise in May of 2018. We came into the exercise one morning and had an email, exercise, 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 that said USDA is recommending a 72-hour national movement standstill for all susceptible species, cattle, semen, and embryos. This was also exercised during SPHERE, which was another functional exercise in September of 2019, this time focused solely on African swine fever, which impacts only swine at this time. So those two 
exercise policies were tested, uh, caught a little off guard, um, especially in May of 2018, but really trying to look at what would the states need as far as their capabilities to implement, enforce, and support a national movement standstill. So what does a national movement standstill look like? Well, it's been proposed it could last up to 72 hours, or I should say at least 72 hours. And the whole goal behind that is to allow our regulatory officials to get their arms around where disease is and hopefully where disease isn't. So during those 72 hours, that's when control areas may be designated. Finding the infected premises, putting in control measures around those infected premises. And after a 72-hour period, then maybe the standstill will be lifted. Well, during that 72 hours, while investigations are happening and trace facts are happening, foot and mouth disease control mechanisms need to be put in place for that infected premises. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that entails. So beginning of an outbreak during that national movement standstill, if that's what's put in place, one of the analogies we give is we need to land the planes. All of those livestock trucks that are in motion, headed for a destination, need to land. In the events of 9-11, as sad and tragic as they are, offer us a good glimpse at what that could look like. If you would have told a business person getting on a plane on September 10th what September 11th might look like, they may have laughed in your face. On September 11th, we put in place, the FAA put in place a, a standstill, essentially. They asked all the pilots to land at your nearest, safest destination, shut off the plane and get out. We'll give you more instructions once we know more. Same thing with our livestock trucks, giving them kind of a, a grace period to say, get to your destination. And if you're continuing on to say a packing plant, a terminal movement, continue on. If you are an hour from home and you're into a eight hour drive, best to return. Again, the planes were shut down for at least 72 hours. In a lot of cases, it was longer, but no new planes took off during that time while our government assessed the situation. Same thing with our livestock movements. It's recommended that no new movements would happen until our officials can get their arms around where this infection is. Packers, processors, auction markets, all those folks that rely on animal movements will also sit idle during this period of time. So before you on the screen is a document called Manage Movement of Susceptible Livestock Species During a Foot and Mouth Disease Outbreak. It's available on the website listed on the screen. There's a two-page overview, a six-page document for our regulatory officials with more detail. But this was created as part of the Secure Food Supply Plan. So it came out of beef, pork, sheep and goats, uh, and the milk side. So this information is to try and give an overview of what managed movement might look like. A section in there talks about considerations for livestock in transit, and this is, this is information that we need to be thinking about now and coming up with plans to solve. Ownership considerations. So if ownership has not yet changed hands, if this happens at our auction market, maybe it's best to return those animals to their origin if the announcement comes out a national standstill is, in, is going to be put in place. Where are folks at with transportation hours? Does an emergency waiver need to be requested at the state level? or at the federal level to allow some of our drivers to get to their destination. Think about the origin of shipment. If it came from an infected, a suspect, those are the farms that are under investigation, or a contact premises, somebody who had direct contact with a known infected premises, maybe it's best to return those animals or divert them to a quarantine location. And that brings us to that last piece. We probably need to start thinking about what would be a plan for diversion and quarantine sites. So are there locations that could be used that are not privately owned? Our auction markets are privately owned, so that may not be an option for folks. But are there places that we could divert animals to should a national standstill come and animals are not able to be returned? Another consideration that keeps me up at night is abandonment. What if they are not accepted at that destination? So. The national standstill is announced, a grace period is allowed, animals need to land somewhere. What if the receiver no longer wants them because of the insuredness, uh, their risk aversion, and they cannot be returned? So this is really where a lot of planning needs to be considered, and this is not just a state or a federal issue. This is an industry issue. 
So talking through some of these things ahead of time is very important, part of that pre-event critical planning. You see a picture here of a dispatcher communicating with transporters. And so what do our normal communication mechanisms look like? How will we communicate those movement restrictions? What are next steps? There's going to be a lot of confusion at this time. So this is the time to prepare and have those discussions now. So as far as state implementation goes of that managed movement uh, or national movement standstill, states really, well, now is the time to start thinking through those capabilities, and many of them have because of some of the exercises that have, that have occurred. So what notifications you see here, a DOT message, right? Could DOT be part of your communication to folks on the road? Uh, what regulatory authorities do the state have? Grace period. So we, again, FAA told the planes, get to your safest destination and, and land. What does that look like? And how does that align with other states? Um, these things came out during the ASF exercise of, you know, what's a good start and stop time since we are 48 contiguous states and things move all over, what does a good start and stop time look like? What enforcement authority does the state actually have? Is there any regulatory action for those caught violating the standstill? And again, DOT is one of the agencies, but what would other support agencies look like, law enforcement, uh, transportation, and such? So these are some of the questions that need to kind of come to the forefront now that we've talked more about a national movement standstill. For the industry themselves, contingency planning becomes very, very important. So how can a feedlot, a cow-calf operation, a stocker background, or prepare to manage cattle without movement? Thinking forward to what potential movements need to happen. Was the order buyer there and you were planning to move in those 72 hours and now you can't? What does that look like? Um, maybe you were planning to move in a week. What does that potential movement look like? What can you do to prepare yourself Number one, to protect your animal from exposure, but number two, get yourself in a position to have animals that have no evidence of infection be able to move on to the next phase of um, production. The financial planning piece, what do contracts look like, whether it's feed uh, with your uh, packing plant, you know, with your next in line, what does that look like? Communication pieces with your employees, should they come to work? How should they come to work? What would that look like during a movement standstill? People will not fall under that, um, but if, you know, if there's a risk of disease spread, extra precautions are going to be warranted. Think about all the inputs and outputs that would occur. Uh, Dr. Tom Portillo had this great quote on, you know, one of the first things he'll do with his yards is, is look at focus on minimizing losses. We know our export markets are going to change, so we have to look at our cost inputs going in. Um, if our cattle that were ready to go to market need to sit for another week, we don't want them getting too heavy for the rails to be able to handle. So, again, what can we do now to think through our contingency planning? That's all part of a continuity of business or continuity of operations plan. The resource that you see before you on the screen is a document that walks you through much of this, and it's available on the securebeef.org website. So let's take it from our national movement standstill to our controllers being designated. So much of the effort is going to be put towards the farms infected with foot and mouth disease, as it should be. We are trying to get our arms around and control this disease, contain it to a small area as possible, and work towards eradication as quickly as we can. Well, then there's this whole population of, of livestock that are within the control area that don't have any signs of FND infection. And this is where the secure food supply plans come in. The goal here of these plans is to prevent exposure so that these animals have an opportunity to move to their next phase of production or their animal products. And that's where the business continuity piece comes in. So once the control areas have been designated and officials have a better idea of where the disease is, then the standstill gets lifted for those outside the control area. So how do we prepare for that national standstill? We talked about the contingency planning. We talked about some of the things states and industry need to talk about. Within the control areas itself, movement's going to be by permit only based on the risk of that actual movement. So for anyone in those control areas, they will need to follow the regulations or follow the requirements of the state and federal officials in order to move. 
The secure food supply plans are working on business continuity for those farms and their animals that are affected by the movement control, but not infected with the actual disease. So let's turn our attention to permits, because this is going to be a big discussion of um, a lot of upcoming uh, workshops with states and industry. So why are they needed, and what is going to be required to get a permit? Why are permits needed? Well, this comes to us from the USDA Ready Reference Guide on Defining Permitted Movement. You can find a lot more details in that two-page document. But permits are the process by which movements get, to, get approved, making sure that state officials and federal officials are comfortable with that movement, and it's a way to document movement. They're for specific items and specific transports or conveyances, and it's anything into, within, or out of control areas. So if you don't find yourself after the national movement standstill in a control area, number one, congratulations, but two, you won't be subject to permits at this time. Another big important reason why we do permits is movement traceability. Our industry partners, other states, the public wants to know what are we doing to demonstrate control of this highly contagious disease. And finally, our international trade partners, at some point, we will need to sit down with them, and we being USDA, having those conversations about reopening our, our trade. And they will want to know, what did you do to try and control it in the meantime? So there's something called a continuity of business permit. And again, these are more explained in that ready reference guide, which you, which you see pictured in, on the screen. There's two types. There's something called an operational permit and something called a secure food supply permit. Those operational permits are things that we need to have normal movements in order to care for our animals. So equipment coming in, um, service crews, carcasses, those things that are non-animal or animal products heading into a supply chain. Secure food supply permits are for the animals and their animal products that need to go on to the next part of the supply chain. And there's defined criteria to meet those. We'll talk a little bit about the information that needs to go into a permit. So again, into, within, or out of a control area is, is where permits will be needed. For this particular example, we might be going direct to slaughter, and that's what we're gonna talk about a lot at the uh, workshop in March with our, our six states and their industries. Need an origin, a PIN, a 911 address. What are you doing to prevent potential spread? That's where biosecurity comes in. Destination, they also need a PIN, they need a 911 address. They need to agree to take it, just like any other business move in a non-disease event, you need to have a destination willing to accept your product. What are we moving? Is it feeder cattle? Is it dry distiller's grains? Is it manure? How long? So this is all the permit info that needs to be determined when a permit gets requested. So for a continuity of business permit, planning, it takes time to get your ducks in line takes time to request it. It's going to take our partners at the state and federal level time to review it. And then it's going to take time for people to receive it, especially if it's an interstate, interstate movement. So the state officials on the other side need to be comfortable with that movement. These are all subject to revocation if the premises status changes. So if all of a sudden we go to a suspect premises and we're being investigated, or we find a contact with an infected premises, maybe we're on a same feed delivery route or the same uh, hauler you know, used their same livestock truck for an infected premises and then hauled our livestock. So these permits are subject to revocation if anything changes. So where can one turn to for continuity of business permit guidance? This is where the secure food supply plans come in. So again, these are focused on movement from premises that have no evidence of infection. You can see listed before you, secure milk, secure pork, secure beef, and most recently, secure sheep and wool supply. Um, milk, pork, and beef were all started with funding from USDA APHIS, and you can see in parentheses how long APHIS funded those. Secure pork supply uh, also has funding from National Pork Board, and they've continued on um, working towards implementation of the plan. Secure beef supply and secure milk supply. We've got some funding again from USDA. Thank you very much to continue conversations between folks working on these issues, implementation, um, so that we can also make some, some updates to documents as we learn more. And our partners on the sheep and wool supply plan, funding solely came from the American Sheep Industry Association. 
All focused around foot and mouth disease, the Cure Pork is also tackling classical swine fever and African swine fever. Where can you go to find more? Each of these has their own website, Secure Milk, Secure Beef, SecurePork.org. Coming soon, in March of 2020, we will have a Secure Sheep and Wool website as well. If you were to go to any of those sites, you would find their Secure Food Supply Plan. So on the Secure Beef website, SecureBeef.org, you can find the eight-page plan, and you can also find a seven-minute video. So if you have an opportunity to educate more folks about the Secure Beef Supply, the video is, is available to you. If you were to open up the Secure Beef Supply Plan or any of the Secure Food Supply Plans for Continuity of Business, this is the list of topics that you'll find. An introduction, what is the purpose behind this? What foot and mouth disease response guidance documents already exist? Please know that we're developing these in concert and in alignment with the goals of foot and mouth disease. There's sometimes a challenge to balance control of a highly contagious disease of continuity of business, but we follow all the guidance that, that is out there from the USDA. Section on managed movement, whether that's animal, semen, milk, pigs, whatever. Then the guidelines in the Secure Beef Supply Plan. What can people do to prepare ahead of time and what's going to happen once FMD is diagnosed? And finally, what we'll spend a lot of time on today is how to request a movement permit and the guidance that is in there. And I should point out, these plans are voluntary and they are guidelines only. What actually happens in an outbreak will be determined by the regulatory officials that are managing bringing us based on the characteristics, its scope, and what we know about the disease. The virus, unfortunately, will not read our plans ahead of time. So while these are guidance, they're probably not going to be lockstep followed in every single case. A part of this continuity of business plan is for producers, and a part of it is also for our very essential packers and processors. Again, FMD is not a public health or a food safety risk. The recommendations that are in the Secure Beef Supply Plan follow suit with what we do today. Animals that pass ANI and post-mortem inspection by our Food Safety Inspection Service are deemed safe and wholesome for human consumption. Again, not a public health or food safety risk. If there are animals in a facility and foot and mouth disease has been diagnosed in the United States, by processing those animals, we can reduce virus amplification and further spread. Once the animals are deceased, that virus is no longer able to be spread, as long as biosecurity is followed with their off-all products and, and folks handling those animals. Processing those animals also reduces the need for carcass disposal. So we're still getting high-quality, great American pro animal protein into our consumers. Things that will have to happen at the plant, much like will have to happen on our farms, is biosecurity around the two-legged, the employees, as well as the truck drivers coming on to delivering animals and after leaving the plant. So those are all considerations addressed in the Secure Beef Supply Plan as well. So if you find at the end of the Secure Beef Supply Plan, this chart, it walks through all the different permitting guidance recommendations that are current today. So there's five areas, and we're going to explore each one of these with a little more detail. Traceability information, trace forward and trace back to find out that the premises is not infected, contact or suspect. Making sure people are willing to accept the product. We've got biosecurity measures in place and there's no evidence of infection based on surveillance. So let's dive into each one of these a little bit more. Secure Beef Supply Plan, while done, and I air quote that, um, is national guidance, recognizing there are nuances in states and so the next big step is how do states take this national guidance and implement it in such a way that even though the virus doesn't understand state boundaries, the regulations need to. So number one, traceability information. I will ask all of our state veterinarians and they will all agree that the first thing anyone needs is a premises identification number. So these are nationally allocated through the Office of the State Animal Health Official. It's tied to where the actual animals are actually located, 911 address, and GPS latitude and long longitude. If you already have one, make sure the information is up to date. If you've changed hands, purchased land, the, the pin stays with the, the geospatial location. So you can go on to APHIS's website and look up uh, who within your state can issue a PREM ID. So this is a number one free, easy to do first step to requesting a movement permit. So who needs a PIN? 
anybody that raises or rears animal, anybody that's going to receive animal or their products. You can see a list on the screen. It's also recommended for feed suppliers, not because they have animals on their premises, but they're the ones going from location to location. So, you know, we need an origin and a destination. So if they are the origin of a feed product that needs to be delivered to our feed yards on a fairly frequent basis, it's recommended that they also apply for a premises identification number. You can find more information by contacting the Office of Your State Animal Health Official or visiting that USDA website. Next up is that trace back and trace forward. We're trying to identify, is this farm infected, contact, or suspect? So the premises needs to demonstrate through their records that they're not a contact premises. Things like animal movement logs, people movement logs, equipment movement logs. We've developed a practice questionnaire for FMD exposure, and it's a four-page short review of what types of movement might have happened on your operation, what types of contacts might have happened on your operation for just the last seven days. It's designed to just kind of get people thinking about what might need to be asked in an outbreak situation. If you can run through this now and it you know, doesn't take a long time to provide some of the answers, great. You'll be in a great situation should you find yourself in a control area during an outbreak. If there are struggle points, as you go through this short questionnaire, that might be a task to try and accomplish, how can I speed this up? Because this information is critical to know before folks will be qualified to even request a permit. Because again, permits are not issued infected suspect or, premise, or infected premises. So health records, no clinical signs, what samples might need to be tested, all that information becomes part of that trace back and trace forward investigation. So our records available, that's one of the big questions. Do they have to be electronic? No, you can see the feed ticket picture here. Not uncommon to find that on some of our livestock operations, but time is gonna be of the essence. If you need to move animals, what data points do you need to provide ahead of time and how long will it take you to do that? So do you have an area that you know, you've got feed tickets, you've got livestock delivery tickets? Doesn't have to be electronic, but the quicker you can compile that information, the better. Next up is, are the state or destination, if, if it's in a different state, willing to accept that product? We need to recognize there's going to be no zero risk with moving livestock or their products in a foreign animal disease outbreak. So in the um, Secure Beef Supply Plan, one of the things it talks about is that the receiver needs to indicate they understand and are willing to accept the risk of receiving those animals or animal products. This is where the state may decide to require a signed form that gets submitted with the permit application. That form might be an owner signing off saying, yep, I talked to the destination and they still want my product. That may be a form that the receiver needs to sign. So again, this is a state implementation decision. Um, so a, a discussion that will need to occur at the state level as to what uh, willingness and what documentation of willingness do the states need in this process? Keep in mind, moving animals to their next phase of production is still a business transaction. That piece of it doesn't change. So the feed yard that wants to move fed cattle to the packer needs to have that conversation with the packer. I, you know, I'm located in the control area. I'm going to need a permit. Um, are you still willing to accept them? That packer may turn right around even before this gets to the state level and say, well, what do you have for records? Uh, you know, what have you been doing to try and make sure that your animals do not have this virus? We don't really want to introduce it into our plant. Um, so what are you doing to protect your animals? So the, per, the feed yard needs to decide, I want to share that info. If they do, then the packer gets kind of first vote. Do they want to accept or do they want to deny it? And then if the state has a form that needs to be signed again, who needs to sign that? So again, discussions are ongoing for this piece of it, but this process still needs to occur before a permit's even requested. Because if the destination doesn't want it, there's no sense in spending time requesting a movement permit. Okay, let's take us back to our movement permit guidance table. Again, guidance. So we've talked about the pin. We've talked about the premises as not infected contact or suspect. We've identified that through records. And then we have an agreement that the destination premises wants to take it. That's great. 
the state, if it's an interstate movement, also gets a vote on that. And that comes once the permit is submitted and sent on to that receiving state. So let's address the two bottom ones. Very important, um, and these have a few details that the states kind of need to discuss with their industry. So this is a picture of the enhanced biosecurity self-assessment checklist for FMD prevention. All of the items listed are things that are aimed at keeping FMD virus off of an operation. We have these for feedlots and we have them for cattle on pasture plus all the other livestock species we talked about to secure food. So each of these steps is a way to essentially protect the herd. And it wouldn't be a presentation given by me uh, if we didn't talk about the castle analogy. So again, thinking, having these feed yards, having these cow-calf operations, think of their animals as being protected by the castle walls. The line of separation is something we talk about in the biosecurity, and that's represented by the moat. Who controls the drawbridge? Well, the, the feed yard does or the cow-calf operation does. We don't necessarily want to let in the Trojan horse. How do we protect our herd? So at the end of the day, in order to request a movement permit, you can't be infected, you can't be under investigation as a suspect, and you can't be contact. So this piece of it becomes very important, and this is all within the producer's control. What steps can they take to better suit themselves to prevent exposure of their animals? So in the self-assessment checklist, this is defined. The in place is defined. All items are addressed in the biosecurity plan and are or are capable of being implemented on an operation, either evidenced by visual inspection, signed in data documentation, or as described in the plan. Pictured on the screen is a template of walking you through each of those items in that checklist and how to customize it for each operation. So at the state level, this is the fourth thing in the checklist. Biosecurity measures need to be in place and acceptable. And this is really where the state need to define for them what is in place and what is acceptable. It's very resource dependent. If you are a state that doesn't have many operations and are able to, you know, personally visit all of these, you know, maybe in places someone from the state has visited that operation, they've read your plan and they've seen things in place. Uh, acceptable. Maybe there's an audit process that needs to occur. For other states that don't have as as many personnel and a large number of operations, this may look different. They may involve in a USDA accredited veterinarian. So how this looks is really where the state and their industries need to have a, a tough conversation about how do we get there. Because what's most important at the end of the day is that we're protecting animals from this highly contagious disease. We want to protect our industry. All the tools that are needed are available on the Secure Beef Supply website to reach enhanced biosecurity for feedlots and cattle on pasture. One of the things we talk about in there is creating a premises map, defining your line of separation, putting your moat around your castle. All of these resources are available on the Secure Beef website under Beef Producers in the Biosecurity tab. So if you haven't had a chance to visit that, I'd encourage you to do so. All of these resources are there. So that brings us back to yet another check mark. So the Biosecurity checklist items are in place and acceptable, again, defined by the states. Next, we need to come to the surveillance piece of it. How do we demonstrate a lack of evidence of foot and mouth disease? Well, there's a series of steps. One, our producers should be looking for this disease. An outbreak has occurred. We want to make sure that our folks out there riding pens looking at cattle are trained to know what to look for. There's a term in the Secure Food Supply Plan called active observational surveillance, and it's just that. I'm out looking, actively trying to see if there are anything wrong with our animals, whether it's changes in production parameters or blatant blisters on the feet, mouth, teeth of our cattle. Next step is farm inspections. So our regulatory officials or their designees are going to be visiting these farms as resources allow in the control area. This may take a role as an accredited veterinarian. They may be part of those farm inspections. So spending time on these operations in a biosecure manner to see what you know, health records are showing and, and what the animals are looking like. And finally, the piece that makes everybody the most comfortable is laboratory testing. 
much like a cow-calf operation, has their animal's pregnancy diagnosed to say, yes, she's pregnant, no, she's not, and makes you know, breeding, keeping, or selling decisions based on her test results, we're very comfortable with laboratory testing. So cattle oral swab PCR testing is one of the options. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But demonstrating a lack of evidence could be a series of these three steps. There's a lot of resources available on the Secure Beef website and many other websites about what does foot and mouth disease look like in cattle. Record keeping is going to be essential. Daily observations of the animals that need to move. Recording normal. If you find abnormals, what do you need to do? How do you report that? And making sure those health records are available for review as part of either a farm inspection, the accredited veterinarian coming out, or part of the permit requesting process. So let's dive into the diagnostic test a little bit more. So oral swabs is, uh, there's a RRT-PCR test available. Uh, the challenge becomes, you know, we want to do additional surveillance for these non-clinical animals. So these are animals that someone has looked at, whether that is the farm or the producer, uh, cattle health monitor, or a farm inspection to say these animals don't have any visible evidence of foot and mouth disease. We really like diagnostic tests in the veterinary world. So which animals would need to be tested? So if you're moving a lot of animals to packing, right, do we have to test all of those animals? Do we test a subset? Do they need to be tested at all because they're going to a terminal movement? Right, if we're moving, you know, cow-calf pairs, you know, and, and it's time to wean and we're moving them to the next phase, which of those animals need to be tested? Do we need to test the cows and the calves? Uh, what is the timing? You know, how far ahead of the movement do we need to test? And then what is the frequency? Is one test of those animals good enough or not? We recognize that there's some collection challenges in our feed yard. So, you know, our animals get to a, a finished weight and they may not fit through the snake. They may not fit into a chute. Um, you know, range cattle, what kind of, a, of equipment do we have to test those animals before they're moved off of the range? What can we safely restrain them in so that our personnel are not getting injured at the same time? So this is an area that holds a lot of promise, but there's a lot of work that needs to be needed behind that. And I know there's some partners um, on the research side from Plum Island and, and ARS. You know, would love to have an update from our research partners through our Secure Beef Supply quarterly call. Um, so if more work is being done on this, uh, please reach out to me and we will get you set up. Uh, because I know there's a lot of interest from industry, from our state and federal officials on what can be done whether it comes to aggregate samples or what. So at the state level, what does no evidence of infection based on surveillance look like? So if training is part of it, how do our state's insured producers are trained? What does that piece of it look like? This is all resource dependent, right? Human resources are going to be limited because a lot of the state efforts, if you are an infected state, are going to be put towards putting out that fire. So we have a lot of folks that want to have continuity of business permits, and that's important. But we have a lot of people that are going to be fighting that forest fire at the same time. What diagnostic resources exist? So comes to farm inspections. Is there a role for our accredited veterinarian sample collection? There's a lot being discussed on the swine side about sample collection and what role do producers and accredited veterinarians play with that? What does that look like in the beef industry? What available diagnostic tests exist for non-clinical animals? What work can be done on aggregate samples? Oral fluids is being part of, of the plan for uh, the swine industry. You know, what does that look like in cattle? Water testing, swiffer samples of feed bunk, um, you know, getting cattle to suck on ropes, all of those kinds of things. Where are we at with that? We need to keep pushing for more answers to have more tools to make it a safer move during an outbreak. A lot of states say we're going to require a negative diagnostic test. Um, from whatever is available at the time. So please recognize that's an important piece of it because we make a lot of decisions on domestic diseases and movement of animals based on diagnostic tests. Our challenge right now is we don't have a big list of those things. Um, so our, our federal partners really are the ones that will be setting the sample type and how many animals and frequency and how do we interpret those test results. So stay tuned for that information. And I think it's important that we recognize today we cannot work on foot and mouth disease virus on the mainland. Right? It's a Plum Island research disease only. So if we get this disease, 
a lot of things will ramp up and we may have additional testing capabilities and strategies to use those tests that actually are developed in an outbreak. So again, as the Secure Beef Supply Plan is written as guidance, an actual outbreak will shape a lot of these things going forward. So that takes us through our checklist of five items, right? Our premises identification number, finding out through records that our premises is not infected, contact, or suspect. We have a destination willing to accept our animals or our products. We've got biosecurity in place to protect our herds so that they don't become infected. And we've demonstrated through surveillance, whatever that may be, that we don't have an evidence of infection. So at this point, then our regulatory officials can consider a movement permit, permit guidance only. There may be other things that come out, um, things we haven't uncovered today, other things that the state realizes that they need to put in place as far as another type of requirement. So that's where the state implementation piece comes in. A few best practices, it's important to request that permit after knowing that destination wants the animals or their products. And then have all that paperwork ready prior to requesting. And what that paperwork is may differ by the state. So let's talk next about next steps. So state implementation, again, hats off to our, our partners that are really trying to dig in and answer some of these questions. So looking through the secure food supply plan, what what adoption level are you at? What additions do you see? What gaps might we have overlooked that you as a state official need to put in place to protect your state herd? Discussing this ahead of time. What are the expectations? What are the capabilities? Having industry at the table to talk about, well, what might stop? How might that impact your business? Could it stop for a couple of days? Can you contingency plan through that? States need to figure out their permitting capabilities, not only the software used, but the human resources. How many continuity business permits could they handle? How many operational permits could they handle? There's still gonna have to be permits for infected premises because there's gonna be a lot of activity on and off of those to control that disease. What type of pre-outbreak requirements might a state put in place or in-outbreak requirements? Things related to biosecurity. Do we have anything pre-outbreak that needs to be audited or assessed or plans submitted. Disease monitoring, what are the requirements that a state will have for the farms or their accredited veterinarians? What kind of records do you want? Seven days, 14 days, 28 days. Those discussions need more discussion um, at the state level. And then again, defining what is the role of the USDA accredited veterinarian? They're a tremendous resource. There's probably not enough of them in some states. Um, and, and what what do they feel comfortable doing? Again, all of these issues are things that the states need to tackle, um, and many of these will be coming out in that workshop uh, with the state working together on that in March. Just want to point out to you a, a, a resource that's available on the website, and I want to thank our partners in Minnesota, the Beef Council, the State Cattlemen's Association, and as well as Extension. Um, we're putting together this 12-page uh, PDF document. It's available on our website. Uh, securebeef.org, and we do have uh, a PDF version that doesn't have Minnesota's information. We all love you, Minnesota, don't take this bad, but um, if, if other states want to customize it to their state, uh, please reach out to me for those steps because we can certainly do that. So just want to point you back to securebeef.org for all the resources that we discussed today. Um, we make changes, we learn new things, our sheep and wool folks, you know, we're dealing with some of the large western flocks. Um, have uncovered some things that we didn't uncover the first time through working on the cattle on pasture. So as we learn more, uh, we're making changes, making enhancements to all of the guidance documents that are impacted. A great big thank you to USDA for funding the Secure Beef Supply Plan, our partners at NCBA for recognizing its importance and, and talking to USDA about that. Thanks to industry, if it wasn't for you guys at the table, um, this might not be as workable as it, as it is today. And thanks to our state, the national guidance has been written and it's really, you know, the ball is in your court to pick this up and run with it. And I can't thank you enough for all that you've done all along the way, challenging us. We need more, we need this, this updated. Thanks for a great job. Um, it's, it's really been a positive partnership. And on behalf of the Secure Beef team at Kansas State and Iowa State, we really thank you guys for your involvement. I'd open it up to questions, Liz. Okay. 
Thanks. Thanks, Danelle. Um, we do have a written question that just came in. Where does the movement of dairy cattle fit within the National Secure Food Supply Plan? Secure beef or milk? Excellent question. Um, hindsight is 2020. Uh, we maybe should have called this the Secure Cattle Supply Plan because uh, as we know, every dairy animal has, has two careers, right? She's a, a milker first and a, a beef animal next. And so the guidance around livestock movement for the dairy industry would fall under the Secure Beef Supply Plan. Okay, do we have any other verbal questions in the queue? We currently have no questions in the queue, but just as a reminder, you can press pound two on your telephone keypad. And does anybody else have any written questions they'd like to submit? Here's one. Can you please comment about what plan might be for disposal? Excellent, complicated question. In the Secure Food Supply Plan, under the self-assessment checklist, there's a section in there on carcass disposal. What approach we took here is we are writing these documents for folks that we want to stay negative and have an opportunity to move as a non-infected premises. So the carcass disposal information you'll find in any of the secure food supply plans focuses on contingency planning for a farm to stay negative. We know all of our farms that raise livestock are gonna have dead stock at some point, and that doesn't mean due to a contagious foreign animal disease, regular type thing what disposal plan might they need to put in place for normal mortalities if they find themselves in a control area? If there's someone that's relied on rendering, are they comfortable with rendering in a control area during an outbreak? The states may not permit rendering for a period of time, um, but they as a business owner, as someone in charge of protecting their castle, do they want rendering? So what contingency plans might they need to develop? They need to talk with their Department of Natural Resources or Environment to figure out, can they bury? Can they compost? I know there's some states that have laws against composting um, cattle because of um, uh, mag cow disease or BSE. And so, you know, what exists? What plans can you put in place ahead of time to dispose of normal mortalities, not due to contagion, normal mortalities on your premises? Now, if we're talking infected premises, carcass disposal, that is federal guidance. We do not write federal guidance. Um, so there are, Fad Prep is uh, a big set of resources on the USDA website. You can get to that through all the secure food supply plans. But we point folks to carcass disposal for infected premises from the USDA. We do have another question. It's in case emergency vaccination is used, is there certain requirements for movement of vaccinated animals from a control area? Excellent question. So FMD vaccination is anything we had time to get into today. Um, I will point you to some great resources. So I'm just going to escape out of this and bring you to the Secure Beef website. So on your screen, you can see um, the Secure Beef website under training materials and outreach you will find a series of videos about Secure Beef Supply Plan, foot and mouth disease, and vaccination. So I would encourage people to, it's a short eight minute video, to learn more about what FMD vaccination needs to look like. The actual plans around using FMD vaccination will come from our USDA partners. We have information on that as well. You can always use the search tool um, up at the top. So you can go to our regulatory officials page, and disease information. And under the USDA APHIS resources, you will find information about vaccination for foot and mouth disease. So the specific strategies that need to be considered and how that might look in an outbreak. We have another question. What size of workforce do you expect a state IMT would need to run a permitting section? And what industry engagement would be in this group? Another excellent question. So size, it's really dependent upon the industry within that state. Uh, we, we talk about this at Iowa State University, so we talk about it in the state of Iowa. And if the control area is such that, you know, we find ourselves in a foot and mouth disease outbreak with 
hundreds of operations that have susceptible animal species. Uh, here in Iowa, we have a team of about six people that work in our permitting branch. Um, it's not going to be enough if we need to do continuity of business permits plus operational permits plus things on and off infected premises. So I don't have a magic number. Um, you know, in the, in the cattle industry, we say, you know, X number of employees for number of head of animals. We've not determined that, to my knowledge, on, on what that magic number is. But I think it's really a formula that the state needs to sit down and figure out, you know, what are the sizes of their industry. And it's a surge capacity question like our NALM labs do. Right? It's an exercise. I think it's an important question of which is so industry and state dependent. There's a second question there, if you could repeat that one. What would industry engagement be in this group? Excellent. So we had industry at the table when we work through you know, RMR and when we work through the African swine fever exercises, and it's invaluable. So I think representation from the industries impacted by the foot and mouth disease um, virus. So how many that is, I have no idea. Um, but I think it really, especially in the ASF exercises, opened eyes as to the complications around a permit. One of the questions that came in was, how long is it going to take you to empty your buildings and, you know, to go to packing? And so, you know, is that a three-day process? So then what's the expiration date, the duration, and the span of that actual permit? Um, having industry there to talk through some of those issues, I think, becomes very important. Okay. Do we have any other questions in the verbal queue? There are no questions at this time. And we have no other questions in the chat. So I think at this time, if you have further questions, you have um, Janelle's email address or you can also contact me and I can get that to her. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, just be sure to watch your emails for our upcoming webinars. Have a great afternoon. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.